Thank you so much, Dr. Peterson. Um, I just want to say that I, I know you probably noticed that I'm the only woman on the panel, um, aside from Dr. Peterson. And um, I don't want you to get the impression that this advice is only for the women in the room because it is very important for all of us to have some semblance of integration of our work and our life because it's impossible not to be yourself at work. You can try, but you will fail. And I will fail to advance the slides. There we go. I have nothing to disclose um, except for me. So this whole talk is about me. That's my first disclaimer. You know, I'm an only child, so this, <laughs> this works for me. You have to do you, okay? Um, I hate you giving these talks because it's really a very personal thing. Um, I'm officially mid-career now, so this advice has taken me a long time to generate. I did not have the confidence to do a lot of the things that I do now boldly that I did when I was you know, in your shoes, a junior faculty member or a resident or um, even a medical student. And I will admit that I did write this talk while I was supposed to be spending time with my family on a Saturday morning. You have to make these choices to be able to do all the things that you need to do. You can't do everything all the time. You're going to have to make some concessions at work and at home. <laughs> and I'm really overcommitted this month. Um, I just showed uh, Dr. Dimmick my schedule for this week and he cringed. So I know that if I have impacted Dr. Dimmick, it's a bad week. Um, several of the other speakers talked about this. This is part of our identity. This is where we live. This is where we love to be. This is a big, hairy trauma case with one of my residents. I don't take these pictures very often. I don't think about this. This is who I am. This is also who I am. I spend a lot of time thinking about problems and how to solve them. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about things a little differently from other people, so I really appreciated Justin's talk today. It is actually an asset to not be like the people around you, but it's hard. This is a classic photo from my life a couple of years ago. This is right after we moved to Seattle. Um, I was just finished my eight years of residency training. I did three years in the lab. Um, we moved cross country uh, three weeks after my son was born. That's actually a kid right there that I'm holding that you can't see. Um, and it was a really hard time. We moved cross country. We did not have a place to live the day that Miles was born. Oops, I went backwards. Um, we did not have a place to live. I was sitting in the hospital on my computer looking for a home. And I, I'm sure you can imagine how stressful that was. Every day brings some new level of catastrophe or chaos, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. These two little guys are so important to me and now they are much bigger. And even when they're picking my nose, I really do love them. Um, I know not everyone has a partner. I could not do it without mine. Um, like I said, this works for me, you do you. This is the reason that I'm here. Um, it is spring break this week. My children are home. My husband is also home. And he's home most of the time. Um, we've made some really deliberate choices in our lives about how we wanted to make our family work. And we've made some financial sacrifices because of that. Um, other people do different things. Other people pay for childcare. Other people pay for school. Other people pay to have the things that they need to be able to make their lives functional. The way we've done it, um, my husband is the glue. Um, <laughs> this is like a more real picture of us. I'm going to try and intersperse like reality in my talk today. This is me sitting outside um, looking at my horrendous calendar for the week, um, trying to coordinate with my husband who is also always on a device. Um, but I just couldn't do it without him. And once in a while I get to do really, really amazingly fun things like sitting at the House of Blues in New Orleans. Um, 
it's so important that I am myself. I'm gonna talk a little bit about social media later on in my talk, but I know there are some people that have like a professional Twitter account and then they have their personal Twitter account. I, I don't have that. You get me, you get all of me, you may not like part of me. I know there are plenty of people that don't like part of me and that's okay, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna live my life. Um, I don't do this necessarily for other people, although I did get a lot of enjoyment out of interacting with an audience. I'm enjoying giving this talk right now. And there's no doubt about it that that is why we do the things that we do. We get something out of it, right? We just heard about the birds and the bees, which by the way, <laughs> I wish I'd heard that talk about 15 years ago. What a great talk. But that was because Steve is really passionate about that and he conveyed it in the way that he was talking. Well, this is part of me. I'm also a skier. We've picked some things in our lives that we really wanna do as a family. Um, this was one of the reasons why we moved here. Honestly, my husband um, grew up in the same area that I did in the country where his parents would take him skiing on big vacations. And so this has become a real important part of our lives. Um, that's Mount Rainier that I'm pointing to. That's the, where we were skiing is about two hours from here. Um, on the right-hand side, that was our midwinter break vacation that we went on in Canada this year. Um, but I am, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you like I'm an Olympic skier or anything. That's me caught in a tree well this year. Um, a, another dose of reality. But it's something that we love to do together. And it's really important for us to do something that's not just sitting around the table and talking to each other, but actually doing an activity. My mom, who you see, I don't have a pointer. Here we go. That's my mom. My mom is, uh, let's see, 78 this year. And six years ago, um, she had just gotten a diagnosis of lymphoma. And, um, She's doing very well. She's never actually had treatment. She has not, um, mantle cell lymphoma, and so she's just in an observational sort of mode. Um, but she decided that she was going to ride her bike again. She used to be a bicyclist, and she just hadn't done it for a long time, so she bought a bike. And she decided that she was going to ride, and she was going to ride a lot. And she actually did this crazy 50-mile ride that Fred Hutch Cancer Research Institute sponsors every year called Obliteride. And she did it because... She went for a second opinion there and they were really encouraging and she just really had a good experience and she felt like she wanted to contribute to that community. So she started riding her bike. So she got me, she, she finished the first year and we were like, you did what? You just rode 50 miles and you're 71 years old? How'd you do that? And she's like, oh yeah, well next year you're gonna do it with me, Heather. And I was like, oh, okay. So sure enough, the next year we did the 50. Um, we actually bike as a family, so there's my mom, my son, who's 10 now, that's uh, Miles, that's me, that's Nash, who's 14, and there's my husband, Chris. Um, we just did the Cascade um, Emerald City ride on Sunday where we got to ride on the highway. We rode on the express lanes on I-5, we rode on um, the viaduct, we rode on the uh, Aurora Bridge, so if you look at a map of Seattle, we just sort of did this little loop around Seattle on the roads, and it was a great event. Um, but my mom really pushed us to like make this part of our family. And uh, my parents live about a mile from us, and it's, it's a really important thing in our lives. We did 100 miles last year, which was a brand new thing for me, and I didn't know that I was gonna be able to do it, but I had um, three friends from Florida come and, and ride with us on our team, and it was amazing. Um, Chris and I, when we travel, we rent bikes and we go riding and it's a great way to be able to see where you are and, and, and know what it's like, but uh, it's not always pretty. Um, I got a head injury when I was in one of my races and uh, that's my husband changing his third tire tube um, when we were um, biking in Hawaii uh, on the lava. It was really interesting. But like I sent this picture to my son when I was in the airport on my way home from another trip, being out of town. No guts, no story. You gotta live your life. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier. This is, by the way, from our 
um, hallway right next to our trauma ICU at Harborview. I can't tell you how wonderful it is to wake up in the morning when you've had a really, really terrible call night. You've gotten five minutes of sleep and you walk down the hall and you see that. That's a part of me. That's a really important part to me. I, the place that I live is important. So we chose to come to Seattle. There were a lot of reasons to choose that, but my husband really wanted to come back out west, and that was important to us. I mentioned that we made some choices that were sort of a financial sacrifice. We're a single-income family. I, I am the breadwinner. The choices that we make impact our children. Um, my husband keeps everything sane. He's the one that is calm and sedate and deliberative and I'm, well, you know what I'm like. Um, my parents live a mile from us um, and that has been wonderful, not only just because of, you know, oh, we have to do this today and we don't have someone to pick Nash up, can you go? Uh, my mom's been wonderful about that, but it's also, that we really have a family here and we have extended family that are meaningful to our children and really um, promote the kind of values that we want them to have uh, when they become adults. My kids walk to our neighborhood school. We live a block and a half from their school. I can't tell you what a decrease in stress that brings to our lives, just having that community and they're really connected to all the kids um, in the neighborhood. And I live less than six miles from both the University of Washington and Harborview. I spend most of my time at Harborview, but I also work at UW. And for me to be able to jump on my bike in the morning and at night, I don't do it every day. In fact, I don't barely do it at all during the winter because it's too dark. And I just don't really like riding in the dark. Um, but we have safe bike lanes here and a lot of bike paths. And, and that quality of life is really important. I have to have time to myself. I have to be able to decompress what happens in my research meetings, in the stressful administration of you know, just being a surgeon. And these are our family values. We have dinner together at least five times a week. Um, everyone in my house plays an instrument. There's my husband playing the bass, my son playing the trumpet. He also plays the electric guitar. He likes loud things. Um, there's Nash playing the clarinet, and we're working on a piece that he's going to be doing an exam in um, June. We take long bike rides and ski vacations and weekend trips, and it's not just like scheduling vacation. It's really time together. We eat good food. We love to eat. We will not sacrifice that. That is a huge expense in our house, and we are not ashamed of it. Um, and we try and get enough sleep. I changed my life about a year ago. I started going to bed a lot earlier. It has changed my life to, in such a good way. I would highly, highly recommend it. I have a friend that's written an amazing book called The Sleep Solution. His name is Chris Winner. He's a neurologist that does sleep. If you have any questions about why that works, you should read that book. He's amazing. Um, I'm just going to have one slide on navigating uh, surgical academia. This is a little bit of what other people have said and maybe a little bit more. I would highly recommend picking two societies and you just attend those meetings every year. You try and even if you're not going to present, if there's a way for you to get to the same meetings every year, you're going to see a lot of the same people. You're going to get into those networks. You, people are going to start saying, hey, would you like to be on a committee? Or, hey, we'd really like you to give this talk. It's important for you to get your face out there. Um, I would say review for at least two journals regularly. So as you know, you're working with other people that are mentoring you, they may flip you a manuscript to review. That would be great. That's great experience. You've got to do that work, or else you'll never be on an editorial board. Um, I'll have another slide about this. You need to find both mentors and sponsors. I think sponsors actually are the fuel for your career, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. One of the things that has brought me the most um, joy and also success is finding collaborators outside of the Department of Surgery. Do not participate in the group think. Go outside your world. Bring in something new. Bring in a new market, the idea market, right? You need to bring in new ideas that are going to ignite the people around you. Someone else had this in their slides. 
it is so important for you to learn from everyone, give everyone the, you know, satisfaction and that moment of your time during your day. You never know who's going to inspire you to do the next great thing and make sure that you give them credit. Um, Jerry Jerkovich told me when he was still in Seattle to say yes to the college, no matter what they ask. And that actually has served me really well. I think it's a great organization. You know, it's the biggest organization that all of us can, can really be a part of. And they really drive a lot of policy in this country. So I'm not here to ding sages. I love this organization, but I would just say, always say yes to the college. But <laughs> say no when there's nothing in it for you, except Never say no to your sponsors. So if your sponsor asks you to do something, it's not usually because they're asking you for a favor that they need you to do. They are asking you to do something because they know that by you doing that thing, your career is going to be boosted. So it's really important that you find sponsors. I went to a fantastic leadership conference this year for mid-career people. Uh, women, actually. Um, the AAMC puts on these uh, leadership conferences. There are other leadership conferences out there. One of the speakers talked about the difference between a sponsor and a, and a mentor, and I'm just going to read some of these things out loud. I mean, these are people that are really advocates for you. They're going to connect you to the senior people. And um, while I did really love Dr. Erbach's slides, the one thing that I would criticize is that I feel like there aren't a lot of people that look like me out there that are going to be my sponsor right now, or even my mentor. And so having that concordance for people, when I was a junior resident, there was no female surgeon that was doing exactly what I wanted to do. And so it was hard for me to find concordance. I don't think you need that necessarily in a sponsor. It is helpful, but the people that have meant the most to me are old white men. What can I say? I don't look like that. Um, perhaps this is the most important slide, and it kind of sums up the things that I've been talking about. You have to figure out what you want. You have to figure out what you want. And it's hard. And it may change. And you may have to stop yourself in the middle of your career and say, is this really working for me? Is this really what I want? You have to identify what brings you joy. It may be innovation, it may be operating, it may be learning new things, it may be generating data, it may be sitting in the library after hours reading surgical journals or cranking out your next manuscript, but you need to make sure that whatever it is, you're doing it. Go to a leadership course. I thought, oh, I don't need to do that. I'm not a leader, I don't need that. That's not what it's about. That's not what it's about. It's about figuring out what you really want. Those courses should be called how to figure out what you really want in your life courses. That's what they are. Get a coach. Get a coach. Don't ask questions. Just walk out of here straight away. Go find somebody that's going to coach you, and, and you'll pay them to be a better person, to be a better surgeon, to be a better researcher. They're not a mentor, they're not a sponsor. You're paying these people to tell you what you're doing wrong, to tell you what you're doing right, to practice stuff, to, to, whether it's in the operating room or whether it's actually like, am I doing the right thing at my job? And consider what changing your job would do for your life. Like maybe you're really happy where you are but maybe there's a new opportunity that you should look at, or maybe you're not very happy, and you should look at how you can change things. Maybe you can change things in your own job. Maybe you can figure out new things that you can do that are gonna bring you more joy and make the stuff that's really hard and, and not all that fun more palatable. Because there's, a plenty of, there's plenty of not fun. There's plenty of not fun. Um, so I mentioned a little bit about social media. I'm just going to tell a very quick story, and then I'm just about done. Uh, about two years ago, a friend of mine, who actually lives in Seattle, sent me um, an invitation to be part of a secret group on Facebook. And it was called Style MD. And I was like, what the hell is that? That's like crazy. I'm not going to be in this. It's a bunch of women physicians that like style. 
So I started, I like joined it because I love this person, I trust her. And it's amazing because a year later, this group that started with about 50 people got together in real life and had a conference, a leadership conference, and we did an adult prom, you know, just girls. It was super fun. It was amazing. Built this tremendous network of people that all really care about each other. We had an event here in Seattle, just a bunch of women surgeons, not just surgeons, endocrinologists, pediatricians, urologists, like all these different kinds of women MDs. And you know, it all started with like, I like that dress. Nothing to do with surgery, nothing to do with medicine, but we were all coming from sort of the same stress, the same problems. And we built this community of people. And you know, I don't know how long this is gonna last, but it led me to go to that leadership conference. I wouldn't have done it otherwise. And it was really great. So these people ended up being kind of peer mentors. And the network was really important. So um, in 1918-ish, we'll just say, you know, 100 years ago, here was the advice to the surgeon, right? You guys recognize all of this? But I would say in 2018, this is my advice to the surgeon. You have to schedule time to write your talks, but you also have to schedule time with people who matter to you. Pay for time. Pay for the things that you can't do yourself. Cultivate a skill just for you, things that don't matter to the people that you work with, but it matters to you. Take all the vacation. Do not feel like, oh, I'm such a good person because I didn't go on vacation this year. I made more RVUs because I didn't go on vacation. You didn't hear him say that. He didn't say that. It's hard to go on vacation because you got to work before and after but you should take all the vacation. And get outside every day, especially on call. I walk to this coffee shop that's two blocks away from the hospital. Yes, the coffee is better there than the one that's right across the street, but it's not just about the coffee. And don't let anyone make you feel bad about it. That's what's taken me this long to figure out. Don't let anyone make you feel bad about wanting to live your life because your time is limited. Don't waste it living someone else's life. Thanks.